Hi, everyone. I'm Grady okay. Hooch. Oops, I'm sorry. You go first. Sorry. Yes. Hello, Grady. <laughs> Hello, Apologies. everybody. Uh, let me just uh, notify here the folks in world that uh, they can tune in to the video, to the um, parcel media. <clears throat> it's uh, audio. It's on now. I hope you can uh, hear us. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 11.30 uh, plenary session of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org. And you can post your questions in local chat on Ustream chat or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. Although it's not guaranteed that Grady will pay any attention to what you are all chatting over here. So it is my pleasure to introduce Grady Bush. Grady is a chief scientist in software engineering in IBM Research. He is best known for developing the unified, unified modeling language, UML, with Ivor Jacobson and James Rambo. He is recognized internationally for his innovative work in software architecture, software engineering, and collaborative development environments. He was, and I believe he still is, a champion for these kinds of environments within IBM and beyond. Grady earned his bachelor's degree from the United States Air Force Academy and a master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Uh, he served as chief scientist of Rational Software Corporation since its founding in 1981 and through its acquisition by IBM in, in 2003, where he kept working until now. In 1995, he was named a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery. And he is an IBM fellow and was recognized as an IEEE fellow in 2010. So thank you, Grady, for coming here, talk to us, and take it away. Thanks very much for having me. We are an unusual bunch here as we sit in this virtual space because we are of those group who really grok what it means to live a life, a virtual life. And what I'd like to do in the next hour or less than we have here today is to tell you about my journey into this virtual life. And it would be interesting to get in dialogue with some of you as well to understand your journey through this life. I have done gosh, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 lectures and presentations, uh, mostly in Second Life, a few in OpenSim. But uh, this is a very natural thing for me, as, we'll, as you'll see here in a bit. Uh, doing these kinds of things in world is almost as natural as doing it in the flesh for the reasons that we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. I am deeply influenced by the ideas of Joseph Campbell, um, the late and great mythologist. Uh, Dr. Campbell spent his lifetime trying to understand the stories that we told ourselves and the stories that transcended color, uh, cultures. His classic book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, uh, was actually the basis for a lot of great other storytelling. Uh, George Lucas was heavily influenced by, by his ideas. And the hero's journey that uh, Campbell speaks about is one that we see repeated over and over again, uh, not just in the literature and in movies and TVs, but it's interesting to parallel one's life in that way. One of the things that, that Campbell said that really resonates with me is this notion that we live a world in which we put on masks. Um, now, he's not a psychotherapist, he's a mythologist, so he's looking at this from the lens of how, over time, culture has expressed itself. And his observation is that with these masks, we still tend to have some common stories below the surface, and those masks are simply views into those worlds that we have. There's another way to look at it as well, and this is uh, the work from Carl Jung and his ideas of the archetypes. Uh, Jung's notion is that there are indeed some common elements in each of the journeys that we have. And at one time or another, we all play different roles. Uh, there are roles of the explorer, there are roles of the gesture, the ruler, the sage, the magician. But collectively, you can see that uh, each of us is, in a way, a composite, a delicious mixture of these kinds of different masks that we play on, that we put on. And 
we put these masks on at different times and in different places according to different circumstances. There's a delightful article that just came out this morning by Bruce Shiner, uh, the, the d delightful gentleman who, uh, who speaks a lot about security and, and privacy issues. And he observed that the present generation, uh, not me, but the generation or two after me, uh, has come into the world in a very different way with, re with regard to the expression of the masks they put on in the world. Uh, with Facebook, with uh, Snapchat, with Instagram, etc., there is a different kind of sharing that goes on in that generation, the digital generation, the generation that was born not knowing the internet never existed, very different kind of, of putting of those masks on. And if anything, we've seen this increasing dropping of our masks as we move into the social arena. Uh, it used to be the case, especially if you look at British society, incredibly formal approaches to how we put on our masks. But if you contrast that with the average tween who's sharing or oversharing on the internet, very, very different world indeed. So let's talk about my masks as we begin this particular journey. Um, I'll go to parties sometimes, and especially parties where people have no clue who, who I am. And the usual cocktail banter is, so what do you do? Um, that's always a difficult question to answer. The first question, depending upon who I'm talking to, will be, oh, I'm into computers. The problem with that answer is if you talk to somebody who is utterly clueless about the computing world, uh, they will say, oh, my son, nephew, uncle, whatever is into computers. Um, they have a PC and, and their job is to, uh, to build websites uh, for, uh, for local businesses. And oh, by the way, just like they would ask a doctor, uh, my PC has running, been running slow. Can you come over sometime and help me fix it? So the problem is that we find, when I say something like that, you get people's reactions who are like, all computing is the same. So somebody who, who puts up a simple uh, website via GoDaddy is the same kind of computer person who uh, helps design software for a satellite or you know, helps build something for some weapon system or helps build some financial system. From one perspective, uh, they view the stories to be all the same. Um, and it's not quite exactly that. So sometimes I'll advance it by then saying, well, I do software to distinguish the software and hardware bits. Uh, but then that discussion will immediately go to say, oh, let's talk about this app. And so uh, do you build apps? Well, yeah, but not exactly. If I wanted to be a little bit less humble, I'll say, oh, I'm an IBM fellow. Uh, problem is, People have no clue what that is, so that doesn't go very far. Uh, if I want to, uh, you know, really start the conversation going, I'll say, oh, I'm an author. Uh, and unfortunately, the discussions will sometimes go to, gosh, have you read Fifty Shades of Grey or something like that? Well, I'm not exactly that kind of an author. Um, if I really want to confuse people, I will put on the mask that I'm a free radical uh, because that, indeed, that's one of the titles on my business card, uh, because then that helps explain to them that I'm a little bit of an out-of-the-box kind of guy. Problem with these roles is that all of these things are true. Uh, it is the case that I am into computers and software and a fellow and an author and a free radical, but none of them are really sufficient. So another way, oh, somebody asked, what is an IBM fellow? Well, I'll be happy to tell you. Um, IBM is one of the first companies that's uh, produced the fellows program uh, of the, gosh, let me think. It started in 65 by Watson himself, and it was attempted to provide a path for the most senior technical executives within the company. Basically, there are two paths that you find in all organizations like that. You're a technical geek, you keep doing technical stuff, and all of a sudden you get to a certain time and age and experience and they want to promote you. So what do they promote you to? A manager, which is absolutely the wrong thing for a good technical person to do. Um, so there is a separate path, and therefore the fellow is basically the equivalent of the CEO. We're the most technical, senior technical people in the company. There are, I think, only about 150, 
50, 160 fellows that have ever been appointed inside IBM through its history. Currently, there are under 50 of us who are still alive and active. The easiest way to become a fellow is win a Nobel Prize. There's no Nobel Prize of software. Uh, so I just did it through my geeky stuff, and the CEO appointed me a fellow in 2003. The great thing about a, being a fellow is that uh, pretty much I, I'm given the license to go do the things that I think are important for the company. And so this gives me degrees of freedom uh, to go do the technical things uh, for the future. Basically, my job role is twofold as a fellow, uh, and this was told to me by the CEO. Grady, go off and invent the future. That's a pretty cool job. And the second is destroy bureaucracy, which is pretty fun, too, because IBM is a target-rich environment. So if I go to the next level, you know, what do I do? Well, I can talk about the roles that I play. I'm chief scientist, which means I, I, I cover a whole bunch of different, uh, different fields and I kind of bring people together. I'm a software architect. I'm also a cognitive scientist. Uh, you'll hear more about this if you follow my, my Twitter stream, but uh, basically I'm doing a lot of work in what happens beyond Watson. I also still code. I mostly work in Java and PHP and little bits of C++, but I do that as well. And I'm a researcher, which means I'm continually worrying about the future. So that's kind of the things I do, some of the masks I do. But still, that's not enough. It's kind of the roles that I play. What are the things that I do that define me? Well, I mentor people. I, I, uh, I'm a theorist. I'm a software archaeologist. I'm on the board of the Computer History Museum, and my interest there is the preservation of classic software. Uh, I'm a mediator. I'm a historian. I'm a visionary. I'm all these kinds of things. But, you know, if you think about defining a life, that's still not exactly what I am. So how about the jobs that I have done? Well, done a bunch of things. And, uh, ooh, this slide's not coming up. Oh, I love it. Let's try to go back again. Well, I'm looking at a blank slide. Oh, there it is. I had a little latency. Sorry, I should have been, uh, been faithful here. So I could take a look at what are the jobs I've done. My very first job was to mow lawns. In fact, I, I, uh, I did this, gosh, I don't know, starting 11, 12, and used all my money to buy the components so I could build my own computer. That was my first, first real job. I was a scooper of ice cream. My first job for which I had to pay taxes was at Baskin Robbins. I'm a singer uh, by act of Congress. I am a, uh, an officer and a gentleman. I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1977. I'm a godfather and a husband, so I'm, I'm all these kinds of things. But still, that's not quite it. Another way to look at my journey is what's my, what are the, what, what are the, the ways that I go through life. Well, I'm a child at heart. I'm a warrior. I'm a leader. I'm a lover. I'm a believer, a philosopher. And the way I often describe myself is I am an awestruck seeker, meaning that what really defines my life is trying to step back and just staggering awe of the amazing nature of life and then also the nature of just the fact that we have the opportunity in this journey to, to do some amazing things. So here's my conclusion on this. This is really a life of ands. None of us goes through our journey in life as living just one of these roles, nor do we live these roles sequentially, but rather we live a life that's defined by the role we play at the moment, but the collective result of living all of those things fully in the moment. And so, at any particular moment, you see the world through the lens of those, those particular masks we play, and we present ourselves to the world according to the masks we wear at that very moment. The interesting question for me, therefore, is what does this virtual role that I put on do to the lens in which I see the world? And what does this virtual world do to the lens in which others see me? So let's talk a little bit about that virtual life and the journey that I ran through that. I'm unusual, like I think many of you, but if we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, we're, we're a very unique bunch, those of us sitting in this room right now. For me, and I would imagine for many of you, my virtual life is not a mask, but rather it's one of a trinity of places where I wear my masks. Now, 
I'm going to expand upon this in a notion, but let me let me mention one thing in particular right now. Um, there are some of you who who I know spend a lot of time in Second Life, and many of you who are not here but also spend time in Second Life, for which your Second Life is quite distinct from your real life, and so that's okay. We intentionally have different kinds of masks like that. So I would observe that there are people like you and I now, we can begin to divide the world in a couple of ways. And how does the joke go? There are one zero kind of people in the world, those who get binary and those who don't. A little different kind of thing. There are some people who are, are, are comfortable in only one world. Uh, there are people who are at home in multiple worlds, meaning that I've seen people come into Second Life and other virtual worlds and they just don't get it. They, they they look at it as if it's just this incredibly foreign kind of thing. IBM did an experiment some years ago in which we did a major conference entirely in Second Life. And it was a fascinating experience. Um, this was a time where, for whatever reason, uh, up, upper management said, oh my God, we can't afford to do this conference anymore. And so someone came up with the notion of of, uh, of being able to, uh, to do this conference fully in world. Uh, this was the Academy of Technology conference. So as a fellow, you know, I sort of see across all of IBM, but there's a, another tier of folks uh, where we have an academy that people are nominated to, voted into. It's kind of like the Academy of Sciences, uh, but it exists to allow us to cut across all divisional boundaries of the, uh, of the company and put people together in one room to, to have serendipitous connections. Well, for better or worse, one year they decided we don't have the money to bring this together. I mean, it was a, a multi-million dollar conference for IBM to do this thing internally. So we had the idea to do this thing uh, fully inside Second Life, and we spent a considerable amount of, of resources doing so. We had people who, uh, who, who, who built enormous numbers of sims. We probably at one time had, I think, three to 5,000 people. Uh, in Second Life for this particular conference. And as a long-time Second Lifer, it was interesting seeing the people struggle who were brand new to it and had never really thought about being projecting themselves into a virtual world. I think one of the reasons that, that contributed to IBM's pulling out of Second Life is that was an experiment that just did not go well. Uh, that I don't think we did a good enough job of setting the expectations of users, of uh, telling them, really educating them how to do it, but we kind of threw a bunch of people into it, and the reaction was negative. So we didn't, we didn't get them, they didn't get their minds in the right place. And you could really see this bifurcation. There were some people at home in the physical world. There were some people who were really at home in the virtual world. And, and you know, I would say it's probably a 60-40 split. There are 60% of the people in IBM who just didn't get it. There's, there's another further division. For those of who get virtual worlds, I find a further, further division in that there are some who use the virtual world as a canvas. It's a delightful place to be. It's another place to express themselves. Uh, they can build some wonderful things. But there's another group, and those are the people who really project themselves into the virtual world, and they become part of the canvas. I don't know how many of you fit into that category, because I've not interacted with some of you, but you know who you are. You are the folks who dream in Second Life. You go into the second, you go into world, uh, into a world, your screen's full now, and it is as if you are there. You feel things from the things you see and hear. It is as if you are physically present within that room. It is a total projection. And there are some who get that. I am one of those. That I have visceral reactions from being in Second Life just as if it were real life. And even though I cannot tust, uh, uh, touch or be touched or, or taste or smell, all the other senses are active and it's like I'm there. Uh, the day I get my Oculus Rift connected to some haptic interfaces, then by God, I'm, I'm out of it for the real world, I think, for a long time. There's this great series of, uh, of books uh, by an author named Grant Naylor. And it's actually not a guy, but it's two guys, Grant and Naylor. Uh, the first in the series, it's a British one, uh, first in the series is Better Than Life. And of course, it comes from Red Dwarf. The second one is... Uh, 
I forgot the second one of the series. But the idea is, and if you learn the premise, is that uh, there are some folks that are captured, they're caught in a virtual world, and it is so real for them. In fact, it is better than life that they wish to not leave. Um, another lecture unto itself, but, you know, I think that uh, we are on a path to that kind of world for reasons that we'll see here in a moment. So l let's talk about some interesting parallels. I'm going to talk about uh, a brief history of me, Grady, in the physical world. Then I'm going to give you a brief history of Grady in the virtual world, and we're going to see some interesting, interesting parallels. So this is me as a little baby. That's my mom um, holding me. I think it was, you know, just a few months old at the time. And uh, it was an interesting culture. My mom was uh, fully German. She uh, was, she born, raised in Germany during World War II, uh, married my dad after the war. Uh, that's me in my Cub Scout uniform. The lower picture in the lower right uh, was me, I think, in high school. I actually have a, an interesting uh, IBM experience. I told you earlier about uh, mowing lawns. In fact, the first computer I built was at age 12. That would have been 1967, so I was a geek who was truly a geek that was a stranger in a strange land because nobody was doing that back then. Um, but uh, I also then wanted to move from just hardware to software. So I remember knocking on the door of uh, the local IBM sales office. I grew up in Amarillo, Texas. Nobody was going to hire a 12-year-old, so I was going around trying to find a, a somebody that would hire me. Uh, and I finally ended up at IBM, and I said, hey, I've done some cool stuff, uh, but I want to learn how to program. And a sales guy took it upon himself to, uh, to give me a Fortran manual and say, you know, go away, kid. You know, go read this and come back when you figure it out. Well, I came back two days later and had written some programs and kind of the rest is history. So, so IBM, know it or not, influenced my career. So as I moved forward in my career, and this is, again, way before virtual world kind of stuff, I graduated from the Air Force Academy. That's me on the, the, the left. And as you can see, I looked very different uh, uh, before my long hair. My wife ruined me, of course. Um, this is when I began to experience the notion of virtual stuff. Some of you uh, may have heard of a system called Plato. Uh, Plato was just radically cool, and it blew me away. Because uh, here, we here we were. This is in you know the early seventies, mid early to mid seventies, way before the the internet became big and real. And Plato was a system built at I think at the University of Illinois that was one of the first uh, multi-user kind of real-time interactive systems. There was an awesome game in it. Um, it was a uh, um, uh, an aircraft game where you could pilot an aircraft and sort of go around the world and interact with people. Um, and, and it was it was amazing because I remember conversations I had, uh, real-time chats with people all over the world, in Europe and uh, across the U.S., and it blew me away. And that was the beginning of my, my virtual experience because now here I had an experience that allowed me to interact with people in real ways and I began to project myself. Um, I graduated from the academy, started a software business uh, with a couple of my classmates in the academy, grew a beard because I didn't think I looked old enough. And we, here we were selling this million dollar machine and I was this fresh faced 20 year old right out of college. Nobody believed me. So I grew a beard to grow a little old, look a little older and uh, here I am still today. As my history progressed, you know, we built a machine, the R1000. I uh, wrote a bunch of books, invented the UML, yada, yada, and here I am. And virtual worlds are a part of what I do. I continue to, uh, to live and breathe in, in virtual worlds, even though IBM is not there a great deal. Uh, I do spend a bit of time there, and I continue to give lectures like this. So let's talk about my virtual history. Um, and I'll tell you why I got here in a moment, but let's, let's talk about what that virtual life was. Uh, I managed to keep some pictures of me through my, my virtual life, and whoops, I went too far, I think. Yep, no, this is the right one. This is the right one. Here's, here's why I got into my virtual world. I remember I'm going to talk about it now. Um, during much of the middle 2000s, I kept pretty busy not dying. Um, oh, in Second Life, you want to know who I am? I'm a Leem Theus, A-L-E-M-T-H-E-A-S. I have an avatar that's, uh, 
that's Grady and Grady Booch, but I mostly spend my time as Aline. So in 2004, by that time, my dad had died of an aneurysm. My uncle had died of an aneurysm. And that summer, my nephew died of an aneurysm, Thomas. Thomas was just a delightful young man, brilliant, spiritual, energetic, and uh, spent some time with him. The picture there is the two of us uh, that you see uh, when we, we took some time in the Colorado mountains. But in the summer of 2004, uh, Thomas died suddenly. Uh, he was with his father. We had been working out. Uh, 30 minutes later, he went down to go to sleep, took a nap because he wasn't feeling well, and he did not wake up. Uh, devastating for my sister and, and my brother-in-law. But it turned out to be an aneurysm as well. Well, my wife immediately took me to, uh, to the doctor, and I had a CT scan, and sure enough, I had an aneurysm as well. And the problem about aneurysms is that uh, the, the, the major symptom of an aneurysm is death, which is not extremely predictive. Uh, you sort of die, and it's like, wow, okay, oh, you had an aneurysm. So we went on a journey to try to figure that out. Uh, I spent some time with the Mayo Clinic, and they said, yes, indeed, you have an aneurysm, and you basically you have a ticking time bomb inside you, but there's something we can do. Uh, at that time, they didn't know it was really genetic. It's clear that it is now. Uh, so if you have somebody with an aneurysm in your life, you, know, you ought to get yourself tested because it's a good chance that you're going to have some, some of those same genes as well. But that was, that was transformative for me. Uh, in 2006, I underwent... Uh, I underwent uh, elective open heart surgery, if you can think of such a thing, with the intent of killing the aneurysm before it killed me. And it was successful. It took me about uh, nine months of a physical recovery and probably about two or three years of a spiritual and emotional recovery. This is the time I moved into Second Life. Uh, IBM was just starting to get into it. I had recovered, had the surgery in the summer of 2006. I was mostly physically recovered by the end of that year. And I wasn't traveling at all. So I was trying to find some way that I could continue to interact with the world and still leverage the ability to, to do so as I had done before. And Second Life was the opportunity to do that. So that's when I began my journey of my Second Life. And this is a picture of my first avatar. Oh my gosh, was it clumsy looking. And this was in the earlier days of Second Life. And they didn't have meshes. They didn't have, you know, prims that were, you know, really fluid kinds of things. And so uh, this is as good as I could do. This, yeah, very much a 2007 avatar. Uh, pretty much the normal body, but uh, I, I built a beard and hair as best as I could, and that's, that's about as good as I could get. Well, I eventually then got a few more, you know, a little bit more ability under my belt to, uh, to be able to, uh, to model my own av a bit better. I uh, commissioned somebody to do my hair, uh, which is the hair I still have in Second Life, and it moves, and it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, the face wasn't quite right, uh, but good enough. And uh, this is the avatar that I used for, for the longest time. Yeah, it, somebody said, we had to walk to school in the snow with no shoes. Well, I remember the days when, my God, we only had ones and zeros, and life was so hard that some days we didn't even have ones. My God, was it hard, you young whippersnappers. Um, if you move to... To where I began doing my lecturing, um, this was one of the first builds that Rational did. Rational did a conference. It was, I think, one of the best conferences we did in which we actually did filming in Second Life. And there was this wonderful backstory about these superheroes that came together. And we had sets for it and different characters. It was awesomely cool. I think this was a session in which I was, uh, was giving a lecture about this whole thing in preparation to it. Um, so, and this is me in that same avatar you saw there. Saw there. This is actually from a photo shoot we did in World for a, a, a series that went under the New York Times. And a funny story I should tell you, in that um, uh, I, I presented these pictures to uh, to folks and to, to put in the article. And IBM's PR people said, "Oh my God, uh, you you can't do that." Uh, because look at that woman in the front row. She's showing too much skin. And it's like, oh my God, it's an avatar, for goodness sake. There's, it's, it's just bits. Get over it, IBM. Well, eventually they, 
they had me do some other stuff and I had to, you know, we had a different one, but it was, it was good enough. And we, we got second life on the New York times. That was kind of cool. Um, it was from that, that meeting that I first began to, to really develop some long-term relationships with folks in, in Second Life. There are IBMers that, that I, had, I have never met to this day, and I only know them through Second Life, and we have you know, long-term, a long-term connection. That's, that's still very cool. Um, this was sort of in the time of my more mature Second Life, as I started spending time there. I, I actually, for a time, had... Uh, uh, had regular office hours. Um, this is part of the build that I have, a little seaside kind of thing. And I would bring people to this to give uh, mentoring. I would uh, do regular lectures. I would have office hours so that uh, because I was a remote worker, uh, people could always come there at a particular time and come meet with me. And I would have people randomly come by. And that was cool because it allowed me as a remote developer to uh, to have office hours where I could have serendipitous connections. My building skills got better. Eventually, built uh, uh, built this classic kind of room, and it really was the place that was home for me. I mean, frankly, it was a place I would go away to. It's like, oh, I'm living in this place where there's great weather. I miss the rain or I miss the snow. So I'd go put myself in the virtual world. I'd leave it on on a screen and I'd turn on the rain or the snow and I'd still work on my office. So it would be as if I was there. But so a pretty rich environment. And you can see that there was quite the progression in my virtual life from just I'm t playing with it to, no, it's really, really part of my life. However, let me observe that this is not just the only aspect of my virtual life. If we take a very broad view of what virtual is, I realize that we create our own virtual spaces. My first email address was in 1979. I was at the Air Force Academy. It was still the ARPANET, hadn't been pushed out before. And uh, I had an email address. I think this is what it was because obviously I don't have it anymore. Didn't even have the dot to it. I think at that time, oh, I remember this. At that time, we had a little book. It was a mimeograph. Yes, we had mimeograph back then. A uh, little book, maybe 20, 30 pages that listed everybody's email address in the entire world. The, the, the internet was that small. So I knew everybody's email address. That was pretty cool. And that was the beginning of that virtual life. Today, I have six primary email addresses and God knows how many others. I have accounts to 200 distinct sites. I broadcast through a whole bunch of, of social media. If you want to follow me, uh, go follow me on Twitter as Grady underscore Booch. And that's, that's where I primarily tweet. I have one blog. I do a regular column for I've Triple D. And I have seven known public, public profiles, uh, including one on Wikipedia. So these are the lenses through which... I project myself to the world. But there are some other ways as well. I also have a tremendous amount of, of virtual presence through video. I use Skype regularly, using it today, and I use, also use Polycom quite a bit. Here's a screenshot from a, a conference that I was involved with just a few days ago. And uh, it was a conference involving people from, I think we were in five different cities. And you can see me in the upper right. Uh, if you zoom into my avatar, you will be amazed to see that my avatar looks very much like what I look in the real life. I, uh, both here in Open Sim, as well as Second Life, I did a, uh, took some photos of me, went through a service that did the skinning of it, and so my avatar in World uh, looks as close as I can to to what I look like uh, in the real world. So these kind of video conferences <clears throat> are very common to me. It's what I do all the time. I also do a lot of telepresence stuff. Uh, we have at various uh, IBM laboratories some beam robots. And so from time to time, if I can't fly out there, but they really want me to be present, then I'll show up in a beam robot. And that's not quite as good as being there physically. It's a little bit better than a video conference because I can turn and look at the person I'm talking to. And this is yet another part of that that visual experience because it gives me a way to interact and now people look at that robot as a proxy for me. Why do I do all this? Well, I forgot to mention that I live in Maui and so I'm actually doing this conference right now from my office that overlooks the beach. I'm sitting here in a swimsuit for goodness sakes and this is the view that I have. 
So my virtual life is a classic example of how I can uh, live in a world that is unbounded by physical presence. Um, this is my view. This is how I live. I, I don't have a commute because I walk from my bedroom to my office. And so it is understandable why I leverage these virtual techniques because they allow me to project myself in ways that I never could have before. And that's pretty amazing. Now, that's my journey. It's a unique one. And it's one for which a virtual world is as natural to me as putting on my clothes here because it allows me to project in ways that I could not have done so before. So I make the premise that we are moving to a state of the world where you and I as pioneers in this space are going to be moving into a world that is increasingly like the world I just described. Now this is a lecture unto itself. I want to make sure there's some, there's some time to uh, uh, to, to talk about this, but I, I did a study some years ago, not some years, about four or five years ago, in which I tried to project out um, what the state of the world might be. Um, looking at a variety of sources, pinging my colleagues inside IBM, uh, I, I asked myself the question, what's the world going to look like in 2031? And I'm going to touch upon a few of those because they directly impact our virtual world. Uh, if you if you extrapolate from current population trends, um, a number of folks suggest that we're going to hit a, a peak population, global popula population, maybe just somewhere under 9 billion people. Um, why do we think we're not going to peak much more than that? Why do we think we're not going to hit 10 billion? Well, you'll find that the third world countries, the uh, the uh, birth rate still is increasing. It's dampening a little bit. In industrialized countries, birth rate is actually declining. And as countries move from third world, second world, first world, there seems to be this natural break upon population. And extrapolation leads us to there. There's this, actually, there's a global decline in fertility rates. And there is a beginning to global uh, population decline in developing nations. This is especially interesting with regards to... Uh, uh, to what's happening in Japan. And yes, Jeanette, you point out the issues of water as well, too. That is absolutely a limiting factor in, in the issues of food. The phenomenon that's happening in Japan is particularly interesting because here you have a society that's actually declining in size of, of native Japanese. The, the skewing of the population of the elderly is absolutely enormous. And so there are more people who are elderly and fewer people to be able to take care of them. You add to this an interesting cultural aspect of Shintoism, where Shintoism projects onto the culture that inanimate objects may indeed have a spirit to them. And so, as a spirit, it is not unusual, it is highly accepted in Japanese culture to have robots that are viewed as real kinds of things. You add this to the population factors, and you're finding the growth of experimentation in robotics because these kinds of things are being viewed as, as aids to the elderly. And I think we're going to see that more and more as we find a population that has been born digital projecting itself into this. We're moving into worlds where we're living in these thousand mile cities, decline of the urban, the increase of the urban centers, decline of the rural centers, and that's putting us more in concentration with one another. And in some degrees, because of energy costs, less and less travel. We're becoming in some ways a less mobile society. <clears throat> so it was alluded to earlier about the, the issues of, of resources. Um, a significant portion of the world is chronically short of fresh water. Uh, the Hubert Peak, that, that some believe to be true, I am one of them, suggests that we have now passed global oil production. Some fisheries have collapsed, some have been saved, and air pollution plagues a number of cities. So we're in inconsiderable stress. From uh, an individual perspective, we're also seeing changes in that there is this shift from mass uh, mass. Uh, uh, marketing to micro-marketing, the, the advent of, 
of um, 3D printers, uh, the advent of immersive things like this, uh, the adv advent of Facebook and Twitter and the like are leading to this fragmentation of marketplaces. But it's also re leading to the rise of pervasive personal assistance. Uh, this is indeed a lot of the work I'm doing with inside IBM these days. You've all probably heard of Watson, the system we built that played Jeopardy and beat every human. Uh, Watson was pretty cool, but we see a path that can do even more. Um, and frankly, I'll declare it now, that we believe we have a path of systems that could pass the Turing test. And what would that mean to build an automated system uh, that could be indeed a companion, an avatar, and a health mate? And clearly, with the increased loss of privacy, we all find desires to find those places we can call our own. That, for me, is a push toward more, uh, more of these virtual spaces. Now, a little bit of a plug here. Um, these ideas are coming together for me in some very real ways. And as a, as a fellow, as I mentioned, I have the degrees of freedom to go off and do some cool things. So I wanted to express to you where the next part of my story is. Uh, many of you probably saw Carl Sagan's Cosmos. And, of course, uh, there is a new version of that coming out. Seth MacFarlane bankrolled a new generation of Cosmos. Cosmos. It should be out in the fall of 2014. Appears to have the same kind of structure as the Sagan one, but uh, but I think it's great because here we have a whole new generation, and I think we'll be inspired by this. Uh, it occurred to me that in the computing world, we have just as equally interesting a story, a story that is as wonderful as the story of the awe of the universe. Uh, as the way I put it, the story of computing is the story of humanity. And it's a story that's full of ambition and invention, creativity, drama, you know, all these kinds of things. That's the story of, of computing as well. So a few years ago, as I was recovering again from, from my aneurysm and my open heart surgery, my wife and I decided to go on another journey. Um, I had been in conversation with the CEO of the Computer History Museum. Uh, he knew of my virtual work. He knew of the, the stuff I was doing in IBM. And I said to him, John, you just landed about a $10 million deal with, with uh, Bill Gates to help fund parts of the museum. What are you going to do next? And, uh, and I then said, well, John, why don't you do, because knowing he had been at PBS, I said, John, why don't you do a series about computing that's just like Sagan's Cosmos? And he stopped and said, you know, Grady, that's a great idea. Why don't you be our, our Sagan? Gave me pause. I'm no Carl Sagan. But uh, it intrigued me and led me to say, you know, this is a great idea. So starting in 2000, gosh, would have been five, six years ago, whatever that calculates to be, uh, my wife and I decided to do just that. So we began a jury to build a transmedia documentary, which we call Computing the Human Experience. And you can go to our website, computingthehumanexperience.com, and follow what we're doing. But basically, we have uh, pitched to PBS a multi-part series about computing and the human experience and the confluence between those two. How do those two relate to one another and what's the, what's the dance between the two of them? Um, we call it transmedia because we're presenting this story through traditional broadcast. Indeed, in, this, in, in April of this year, uh, we developed a, um, a teaser along with KQED, the uh, PBS station in the Bay Area, uh, they commissioned the development of a teaser, which we took out to corporate PBS in April, and we pitched the series to them. And their reaction was, this is exactly the series to which we aspire. And so now we're on the journey to find uh, the producer and the director to actually develop the, the full five or six, uh, six episodes we have in mind. At the same time, we have a book series uh, with O'Reilly. Uh, if you're interested, you know, if you have something in mind there on the confluence of, of computing the human experience, reach out to us. We're developing some ebooks and some apps. We have a YouTube channel. We're developing a curriculum as well, too. So, you know, be, be patient. This is still a few years out. I don't have a, a bank, I don't have a patron like a Seth MacFarlane. So we're in the process of, of raising about $5 million to do so. But uh, we will do this. We have a lot of folks behind us to make this happen. But that's our journey. 
a piece of the story I want to say now is the piece of the virtual world. Uh, we have an episode in which we will be dealing with this virtual world and what it means. If you talk to the vast public, this is stuff of science fiction. But for you and I who are here, you know, this is, this is real and it's going to be the future. If you go to computingthehumanexperience.com, you will see a set of things that include our lectures. And uh, those lectures, uh, there are two of them on, on there right now. One is about war and computing, the woven on the loom of sorrow. Uh, there's another one that deals with um, I think, therefore I am. And uh, let me actually skip on, on to another one. Uh, it, it talks about both virtual worlds and robotics. And frankly, it relates to some of the things that Turing said. I'm deeply influenced by Alan Turing. Uh, slide hasn't read from me, but it's the one that says in which, which Alan Turing observed that w he believes a computer would deserve to be called intelligent if we could deceive a human into believing it was be it was human. So that's the notion of the Turing test. You know, I think we should uh, we should uh, try something that's that's not quite that expansive. You know, let's try something that's a very you know, simple, intelligent, not that smart at all. You know, someone like, uh, I don't know, Sarah Palin. Let's set our bar really low. So that's my recommendation to start there, which tells you, of course, my political view of the world. So let's, let me offer you some parting thoughts, and then we'll, we'll have a little time to Q&A here. Uh, I alluded to this notion of a trinity, and I really only talked to you about two of them. Uh, one was my virtual world and second life, and in open sim, the other is my physical world. The third world is this increasing view of me as a robot. I'm actually increasingly using uh, this telepresence robot. So now I have three ways in which I present myself to the world in the flesh, as a robotic avatar as uh, an avatar in Second Life. Uh, for those of you who recognize it, yeah, this is kind of the present, uh, the premise of, of Capria, uh, Caprica and Battlestar Galactica in which there was this sort of three, this trinity of living. And I'm, I'm kind of living that. Uh, and it, it really works for me. It's pretty amazing. Uh, this is not the singularity. Uh, I respect uh, Dr. Kurzweil. I think he's got some interesting ideas. I think the whole idea of the singularity as a particular point in time is absolutely batshit crazy uh, because, as Rodney Brooks said, we're not going to know there's a singularity because we're going to be so much of a part of it. The eye can't see itself in a way. We are moving in this direction, but it's not going to be a singularity, I think, as Ray describes it. It's going to be something that I think is even more, more amazing than what, what Ray can imagine. So I want to leave you with two parting questions. Um, the first is, what masks do you wear? You are here in this virtual world, and that's one of the masks you know. So what other, what other masks might you have? And then the last question I want to leave you, and this is the question I leave whenever I give these kind of lectures to the general public. You know, look, the, the path we're on is inevitable. It is irreversible, and the consequences of it are going to be uh, utterly astonishing. Just, we can't calculate what those, what those changes will be. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is simply, what kind of life do you want to live? And what does it mean to be a human? How do we live as a human? We have a choice. We have a greater choice than we ever could have imagined. And indeed, with virtual worlds especially, and as you saw in my particular life, I have a reach to across the globe, and I never have to get out of my swimsuit. And that's pretty freaking cool. So, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat with you guys. I probably have, you know, 10-ish minutes or so. Um, how do we do this? You want to type uh, me some questions? You want to throw things at me? What do you want to do? Yes, th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grady. That was just absolutely inspiring. I think everybody is super happy that you gave this talk. Um, so, uh, we have time for some questions, and Grady, feel free to, feel free to pick them up as they're being beamed at you. I just want to remind everyone that there is going to be the next session is full of sessions. There will be six parallel sessions going on in about 10 minutes or so. So uh, feel free to throw questions at Grady and he will be kind enough to answer them. It's fun to be here. Thank you all. <clears throat> applause, applause, applause. I tell Google what, t what Google tells me to do. <laughs> yes. What worries me about our future path? That's a great one. Let me ponder that. 
Um, you know, my first reaction to that question and that genre of questions is that I have great faith in the human spirit. Um, I see naysayers, um, uh, naysayers who, who speak gloom and doom, and, you know, they, they raise their hands and wring their hands. But, you know, we've made it through some amazing times. Uh, we, we look at the wars about us. We look at the changes about us. Go look at what happened in the year 2000 when, frankly, the apocalyptic talk was even greater. Look at the time of, you know, being a, a peasant in the Middle Ages. Life, you know, pretty much sucked. So I have great confidence in the ability of the human spirit to adapt and change and grow in ways that we can never anticipate. And furthermore, to focus upon the negative uh, will never allow me to appreciate the moment and contribute to making changes. So very little keeps me awake at night because I have great hope for the future. Let's look at some other questions here. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, you can find me. Yeah, look, follow me on Twitter, uh, Grady underscore Booch. Um, IBM has a singing computer. Yes, IBM does. If you go to the, uh, if you go to the Computer History Museum, there's a, a reconstruction of the IBM 1401, and it. Uh, uh, the way that people used to, system admins used to do it is they put an AM radio right by the computer because you could tell when it actually doing different kind of things. It was pretty cool. Uh, the, my, my bouncers and my handlers are telling me we probably need to leave the room in just a few minutes because I guess someone else is coming here. So maybe a, a couple of more questions and then I'll have to dash. I'm trying to find the picture of my, uh, of my uh, view here. It's a glorious day here in Maui. It's 9.20 in Maui, and once we leave here, I'm going to... Have I read J Jaren's book? Absolutely. I, I, I've read his book. I've never met the man. I think he's an interesting fellow. Um, I think he has a little bit more negative take upon the future than I do. Um, so, you know, find a forum where he and I can be in a panel together, and I'd love to, I'd love to, uh, to chat with him further about that. That would be fun to do. We'll try to do it next year. That would be cool. Get me in a room with uh, with Ray as well, too. That would be fun. Oh, right. Yes, Ray is a great idea for, for future conferences. Just keep me away from sharp objects with him, though. <laughs> <laughs> I respect Ray. He and I have vastly different senses of opinion, though. <laughs> okay. Maybe one more question. Anybody else? Last chance. Yeah, do visit our website. You'll find that I'm exquisitely approachable. I pretty much write, uh, answer everybody's email. So, yeah, get Sarah Palin. Now, I, I'd prefer we get somebody intelligent on the panel. Uh, do I think that virtual disconnects us from the real? Well, I have to, have to attend to your question's premise, which is the virtual is not real. And for me, virtual is just as real as atoms are. So... It disconnects me from a life of atoms, but that does not necessarily disconnect me from the human experience. Almost there. Someone on Twitter was offended at the stab at Tara. Sarah. Well, sorry about that. Yeah, that, that happens. I respect and appreciate what, what Miss Palin has done for the great state of, of, of Alaska, um, but I won't go any further. <laughs> oh, yeah, Sarah, Sarah complained. <laughs> All right. So uh, do you want to close this up here? Thank you again I for the will. opportunity. Thank you very much, Grady. Uh, you, you don't need to rush because all the other six parallel sessions are actually oh, in okay. different... Oh, so so in I different can stay I can stay here and chat. Oh, cool. You can stay here and chat, and uh, the audience, if uh, you want to hang out and chat with Grady, feel free to do so. We are, we are going to officially close it because the streaming team needs to take care of other things, but uh, thank you very much, Grady. Great. Thank you. So I'll drop off of Skype, but I'll stay here in World, and I can type with folks. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me.